Okay, so you're at this talk. Um, so let me let me ask you this: like, who 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 does this for a job? Yes, yeah, show of hands. That that that's what I want. So like, y'all work with production systems in your job. May I have some job titles, please? Just shout out anybody's job title. Cooler the better. DBA. DBA. I mean DBA. Yes, yeah, systems engineer, systems engineer. You got any perform? Uh, you know, uh, any network engineers in the house? No, I mean, ah, mad respect for network engineers. Anyways, um, yeah, uh, glad to have y'all. It sounds like we all have a pretty good idea of. Oh, next slide. Uh, yeah, we all have a pretty good idea what uh, what production is, and so I'm gonna skip all that part. Uh, and the difference between the production and your test, your home, your dev, your lab system, your, uh, you know, punching bag. So when you have an issue at home, what do you do? Well, you could do, yeah, you could restart, brand, you know, restart the whole, the whole node if you wanted. You could, I mean, just putter. You know, it works sometimes. We all need to be cleaning our cases more often. You know, I don't know what's causing the problem. As you do, as you do, as you do. Yep. Or maybe, maybe it is just time for an upgrade anyway. You know, that's, let's use that excuse. Production, our job, our data, our, our livelihood. No, 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 can't, 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 no, 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 wrong. I'm gonna get you fired, mm-mm. So, it would definitely get me fired because this is not any of my stuff. Uh, this is other people's stuff. So I'm a systems engineer at Linbit. Uh, I work with high availability clients. So they, they have clusters of highly available storage that they need to fail over. Um, and we all know it. Uh, this isn't a talk about DRBD or Linbit, by the way. Um, that's just, this is just con, this, yeah, too bad. Uh, that's just con, yeah, context for what I am doing and it informs uh, my need for knowledge on uh, performance and how to troubleshoot, et cetera, uh, diagnose those issues so that I can help out the people that, uh, that have these systems. They also have other clients that they uh, will make available their infrastructure for. So by the time that I am getting a support request from them, I mean, it, there's, there's some definite zeal for that issue to be resolved. All right. Yeah. Oh, I guess I did put, yeah, so that you would need to, you'd be able to know what an HA cluster is. But again, it, this is a, a see me in the booth tomorrow if you want to know about that. All right, so do you ever look like, you know, run to anything like that and you're just like, are they? So these are numbers, but are they good? I mean, is, is that all right? I'm breathing. Uh, all right, so it's gonna go way over here because I'm pretty good at projecting. Yeah, I mean, is is five good? You know, mm -hmm. so it's it's unfortunately a little bit complicated of a question because it depends on your hardware, it depends on your network, it depends on your workload itself, uh, your application, your SLAs. There isn't a good answer for it. So you can't just go Google, is it good number? It's just too hard of a question. Uh, but I'm hoping that I can establish today for you some direction towards is this gonna be good or how can I make it less bad at least? All right, what's that I have next? Ah, yes. So I'm going to give us a few rough concepts and methods uh, for how we're going to be doing this. Uh, 
And then I'm going to di dive into, I have six demos for us, live terminal demos, uh, that's going, that they're going to use those sort of concepts and we're just gonna go through them. They're imaginary scenarios, but they are based on true stories, uh, things that I experience day to day as I support HA clients at Linbit. Uh, so hopefully we can learn along the way. Oh, yeah. I, this slide seemed a little empty, so I just needed to put a little graphic there. All right, so overhead. I mean, it's, it's not that. Overhead is what we have when you have maybe ran top or something like that, and it's going to be costing you uh, processing power as well. The performance impact to actually gathering the metric, uh, which can be difficult because you can't stop uh, on a production system. Yep, so there's ways that you can make it better, make it worse. I can't just be coming up in here running a bunch of S traces and just being like, yeah, I mean, I'm gonna get some data. It's not gonna be good. I just wanted some examples. So, I mean, just here's top. I wanted the slides to look good. And I circled it. So, one of the, w the ways that we're gonna rely the most on in, pr in uh, diagnostics for production system, they fall under observability which is observing the systems as they are, where you're not simulating anything, you're not applying any sort of test workloads. Uh, so all those metrics that are static to the system, they exist, and uh, you can just peel, peel, them, peel them out of there. Uh, this also can apply to static configuration. Yeah. All right. But sometimes that isn't enough and we will actually have to do some benchmarking. Oh yeah, I guess this is a, yeah, if you're just catting like uh, the pressure statistics for CPU, that would be an example, yeah. Pressure, all right. So micro benchmarking, that's going to be a lot better than macro benchmarking. It is a taking a component of the system so something within the data path, but not the entire application workload. And it would sim we'll simulate it and uh, yeah. But it would be an example like you are running some packets across the network. It's going to have lower overhead than just doing like whatever your application might be, uh, simulating that entirely and then saying I don't, I don't know what's doing it, but I'm just going to apply that application again and again. That's not going to get you any closer to uh, the diagnostic of the specific thing you need to improve to get rid of this bottleneck. Macro benchmarking definitely has its place and sometimes you need to do a mix of the two, but I would say you're going to want to, if you can get some observability metrics, um, then we wanna go for some micro benchmarking, some targeted micro benchmarking. But yeah, you, you might need to do some macro benchmarking. Uh, this would an example, I mean, paying is technically an example of a micro benchmark. It's a little one, lightweight. Oh yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a simulation. You aren't, it, this isn't, Macro benchmarking wouldn't be where it's just running in prod and you are observing it. You, you are applying it in this case. You are applying a workload yourself and then you are uh, checking on how the system performs based on that. All right. Yeah, I said all that. All right, well, I mean, I guess I tried, I wanted to demonstrate a little bit for each one and then it was just like, okay. You based on that, you, all right, well, here's how it performed. All right. In order to do that, sometimes you're going to have to characterize the workload that you have because not all IOPS are created equal. Uh, they are, you need to know how your application is impacting the system, the qualities that it has. This is especially 
nuanced when it comes to storage. There are so many aspects to storage um, that I'm so excited about that we'll let, get into later. Uh, but they, they will have immensely different results in the system. They might look similar, uh, but there's a lot of different qualities of them that you can just admire the nature of. Once you can break that down, you can do more effective micro benchmarks that are actually going to be reflective of the workload you intend to put on the system. All right. I, I didn't, yeah, I just, uh, I needed this application to be a little more explicit so that I could, um, yeah, decide that I, that I needed that block size. And so this one just happens to tell me that it, um, it writes 512 sequential bytes to the disk. And uh, so I am doing a DD uh, that will, has a block size of 512. And then I'm writing it to the disk. Performance tuning is what we would want to do kind of last uh, with our production system. That is what you'd expect. It's changing things and seeing if it makes it better. That's something that I would probably do right away at my home lab. I am going to really narrow in on what I'm trying to do uh, because you don't, you also could just, you're not only you're going to be, be impacting your day-to-day -day money machine, um, you are probably going to be getting different results uh, and you're going to be confusing the issue if you do not target it first and you're not di you don't have a diagnosis first. You don't have a specific component that you're zeroing in on. You're just changing random things, you're gonna confuse everybody. Yeah, so I guess I really nice this as an example. Cool. All right, so anyone familiar with the use method? No, well, I'm about to tell you what it is. So there's a lot of methodologies you can use uh, to diagnose uh, performance bottlenecks. Uh, the one that uh, is used most commonly in Linbit and uh, that I find is my favorite that I'm going to zero in on today, that is the use method. And this was uh, developed by Brendan Gregg. Uh, he is a, well, he was a performance engineer for Netflix uh, and he has written some really interesting things. Um, oh yeah, I just, honestly, the, the book is great. Uh, he also has another book that he recently came out with, which is on uh, eBPF, that is really exciting. I don't have time to get into eBPF today, uh, but really nuanced stuff. If you want a deeper dive on this, I would definitely recommend. Uh, he also has some really good utilities on the website. If you just need good like checklists, they're just super handy to have. And so it'll save you a lot of work. In case you wanted to make a checklist, you know, you should take, take, take what he's already done. It's on his website. Uh, but it, yeah, it's use is utilization, saturation errors. I am going to go into what those all mean right now. All right, well, I guess I'm going to go into what a functional block diagram is uh, first. So for every resource on the system, you want to know what you iterate on uh, for each each thing. Oh yeah, this is the one we would use. This is uh, from the DRBD user guide. That's a piece of software that uh, Linbit supports. And this would be, um, it's an example of a functional block diagram. These are, it's not a picture of the system, but rather a picture of the relationships and the components inherent to it. Um, so we have, these have drivers on them, but I, I'm looking at the physical hard disk here, you have the file system, the caches also, um, and then the service layer. So you can tell where everything is interacting. That'll help you, um, if you don't have this for a system, I recommend you draw it just to get started. Uh, or just ask your client if they have relationships like that, uh, relationship diagrams so that you can have somewhere to start. Uh, but this is how you determine what your resources are that you're going to be applying the use method to. Continue. All right, so utilization as it is defined within the use method is the time, the percentage of time that a resource, a component, like we saw in the functional block diagram, is performing work. So let's say we have disks and uh, they're totally idle. They are 0% utilized. We have some disks. 
they are churning, spinning 100% of the time. There's not a time that they're not active. They're not moving around. That is 100% utilized. But I want to be clear with um, utilization in this context because def with definitions it can be a little bit nuanced. A fully 100% utilized resource can still potentially accept more work. Um, I don't know if I say that, yeah. Oh, well, saturation comes next. Um, it's related to utilization, but uh, let's say you have a CPU and it's waiting on disk I/O or something like that. It, it potentially could get a higher priority process that comes in and uh, it's, it's, a, it's able to move things around. And so because it's able to requeue things, it could be 100% it's doing something all the time. It might not necessarily be saturated. Just something to keep in mind. Saturation is related, but that is the time that a resource is, it, it has more work than it's able to process. And it's basically how much work it can't process. Um, something to note about saturation and utilization and your interaction between the two. So let's say that you have a restaurant that is slow most of the time, but then you have a real banging lunch hour and people are waiting outside. Yeah, you, I mean, like, you could have overall low utilization. Um, that's just something to consider. We're gonna see some scenarios later. Low utilization overall, you can still get peaks. Those peaks are important because they cascade through the system and can cause saturation, but then everything else is waiting for it. And yeah, just, just keep in mind those bursts can make a big impact. So even if you overall low utilization. The E of it is a little bit easier. Errors, I uh, don't really need to explain errors. I think we've all encountered one or two in our day. Uh, one of the most, with well, the quickest ways often uh, to diagnose what's wrong with the system is say, what is it telling us? So ask it, look in the logs. Uh, there is a, uh, Brendan quantifies these as like the number of errors. I don't necessarily do that uh, because I don't, yeah, I can have a bunch of errors, but what are those errors can often be pretty important, not necessarily how chatty the logs are because I feel like you could just sort of toggle that into a sort of thing. All right. Ah, yes. All right. Now we're getting into some fun stuff. Let's get to demo number one. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, it's getting all, it's all dark now because my, my terminal's all dark. Great. Okay, so I'm going to set up a hypothetical for you. So I have a... Hmm. Yes, probably. Control plus. Oh, yeah. Is that, is that true? I've got to find the plus sign. <gasps> I have never done that before. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I would not have noticed that because I can see that just fine. Thank you so much. And if you can't hear me or anything like that, yeah, feel free to shout it out because I'm not going to notice. Uh, so just, yeah. Hey. All right, so this is a hypo hypothetical scenario of uh, let's say that there is a client that I have and they are running a DRBD cluster. So they have a, like a, just a few nodes um, in a cluster. Uh, they have said to me, they have configured the instance and they've said that they've recently seen some performance issues and they believe that DRBD is the cause they would like me to investigate. So. First, first, oh yes, 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 yes. Oh yes, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, ah, ha ha, that's, don't look at this. Don't look at this one. I didn't want to run it early because I was afraid I was going to tank everything. All right. 
All right. So I have my CPU one up. Oh, whoops. I did not have the other CPU one up. Control plus, right? Huzzah. Oh, a couple more times? If y'all don't know about Vagrant, by the way, it is uh, super nice for if you need to just test some things. Uh, I, I, we use it all the time at Linbit, so you can uh, just get Vagrant stacks that you just sort of, uh, you set them up in advance, you, uh, then you can use Ansible playlists, uh, playbooks on them, so you can quickly configure some VMs to whatever use and abuse you have. And uh, let me see, Vagrant. CPU zero. And I get in there. All right. So let's take a look at what could be happening. All right. Well, look, what I want to point out here, don't look at the obvious, but what I want to point out here is some things about load average. So, load average, that number, like, is it a good number? Uh, it really depends on what your system is. How many cores does your system have? How do you find out how many cores your system has? You can, uh, let me see what I got in here. I've been in history. I saw this in the Ceph demo, so I kind of like it where they sort of just have all of the, um, the command history and they just sort of paste it in for themselves. Sorry. You know the demos never go right. I'm getting to that. I'm getting to it. Yeah, but I just sort of put the command history in and then I can do all that just so that I don't forget anything. So if we wanted to use like nproc and we can uncomment with that. Let's say we're gonna use nproc. Okay, eight. So the load average we saw was kind of high for eight because my stress ng is uh, being particularly performant right now, uh, which it wasn't earlier, but that's okay. Uh, let's say that we wanted to use less topo. Oh, okay, I didn't install it, but maybe I should install it now. Uh, I think I need hardware lock GUI. Oh. Well, then I'm going to use hardware lock. Yeah, sure. This is nice because if you have um, systems with uh, NUMA nodes, uh, Listopo will be able to show you a diagram of them in some cases. Uh, otherwise, it'll look like this. It's good to look at the relationships between things and sort of make sense of the system. If you aren't in this system all the time and you look at a lot of systems, it's just really nice to get your head on straight and what the number means and what you're seeing when you dive into a system. Yeah, how many cores does it have? What is it? What are we doing with it? Uh, so just keep that in mind. You could do that. Uh, what else we got? Yeah, what did I say that we should do? Oh yeah, you can, you can, Cat proc CPU info, if you so desire. What we got for that? All bunch. Uh, but that's just, that these are examples of how you can take a look at things. Uh, but yeah, let we go back to top. Let's see if this has been distributed evenly. Maybe we can't really tell from this. Oh man, it's really tanking this guy. Anyways. Let's go ahead and we want to see how this is being broken down by processor. So I want to take a look at the MP stat. You need the capital P flag for, you know. And then we can take a look at So what we should have seen, uh, my test might have just completed. Uh, so what we should see is let's do a PID stat. <laughs> Don't worry, we've got five more of these. Okay. So 
Notice all of these that are pinned to, um, well, what m one might consider the fourth CPU uh, that is entitled three here. So let's imagine this isn't stress NG and let's imagine it's um, somebody clever and they have their application on here. Um, and then DRBD, you, usually it's pretty smart and if you don't do anything to it, it's going to pick what CPU, oh, it's going to pick what CPU um, it thinks is going to have the least impact to the system. It doesn't want to mess anything up for you. However, you can decide you do know better than it. And you said to hit, I want a CPU mask of one processor or a certain subset of the many processors you have. Eight, you might be less confused, but let's say that you have like 64 of them. That person might have said, they might have set the mask wrong. They said a, a, a set of CPUs that are going to be associated with particular NUMA nodes. Um, did I tell you what NUMA nodes is? If anyone doesn't know what NUMA is, that's non-uniform memory access. And just really simply oversimplified is the memory module is closer, just physically closer to the processor, uh, a particular processor, so it's more efficient because it's just physically closer together. So you would want to pin it to particular parts. Uh, so you might think, okay, well I wanna do this because I wanna make the system more efficient uh, based on what I know about it. And this person made a mistake in this hypothetical. Because they made a mistake and they decide, they, 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 you can have an overall load average that is low, but you wanna, wanna look at that particular processor breakdown to see if there is a particular one that uh, has has odd use. That's usually not going to happen, but uh, keep, keep those tools in mind to, to see what you've got. Um, PIDSTAT, PIDSTAT's a great one, and MPSTAT is one I like to use for looking at individual processors, what application is churning on each one. And if you intentionally do things with them, just, yeah, keep that in mind. All right. All right, I'm done with you, CPU. I'm done with you. I don't want you doing this anymore. Quite. All right. Do I have my history in here? Oh, I need to control plus all these. And, and. Demo number two. Just so we know, we're moving on. We had enough of that. All right, let's see. Cool. So here's our second hypothetical scenario. We have a client. This isn't our machine, this is someone else. They might be in a different time zone. They might be halfway across the world. This is inconvenient for us because they write us email saying the system is slow, the system is not working, and then you come and you shell in when you should be awake and everything is fine for you. Uh, what do you do? Well. So they said the system, in this case, they said the system is being intermittently slow. We've got, you know, it's, we, we got replication speeds for DRBD slowing down at particular points. But what do we do if we take a look at, I don't know, top and we are seeing it looks fine. Well, uh, let's set up SAR. So SAR is the system activity reporter and uh, yeah it's make sure I have it in my history here mm -hmm. all right I actually think I uninstalled it from this system just so that I can install it all right so it's part of the sysstat package um, and uh, at least it is for you know Debian based systems in this case you want to make sure that you enable it as well, you can't, like, you installed it, but we do need to enable it. So, let's see, where do we go to enable it? I think I put it in here as well. Da, 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 da. Ah, yes. I am going to. Okay, well, it's not there. Oh, I, sysstat. Whoops. Blah, blah, blah. 
Meh. Sys stat. All right. Okay. Right now it's false. Great. Let's uh, get on down here. I think you all have a, an idea of what's going to happen. And put this at true. You need to do that at least for Ubuntu. Uh, I believe you also need to enable it. I'm not sure. But we're going to do it to make sure. See if we want historical data. Okay. Now we need to restart it. This is the initial setup. If you already have this running, that's, this is just for your first time. And then you have it. Okay, now all we need to do is like wait a day, right? So we, you got some time. Nah, okay, I have, just like a cooking show, I've already done it on this one. All right. So. Oh yeah, I, I, I forgot on the other one. Uh, in order to configure it, because I didn't even say that, this is how we configure it. It's just like cron. Uh, if anyone set up a cron job, it works identically, at least in uh, Debian-based distros. So we are going to go into, let's see, am I gonna, do I have it in here? I'm trying to, uh, use all of my things I prepared for myself, but I'm just going to go into Etsy. Uh, something crondy. Eh. Eh. All right. Let's see, we got, we got Sysstat in here. It has already dropped something in. We just installed this. It already has that file in there. Oh, that's why I didn't put it in the command, because it already has it why, the way I want it. But I want you to look at it anyway, because just like you would expect, it looks like you would have in a cron table. Um, for, for anyone that uh, is, uh, needs a refresher on that, uh, we have for, um, for five minutes, um, every ten minutes, and you have, I believe it is, what is it, month? It's a day, hour, day, month, 10 minutes, yeah, uh, just all the time. Week, day of the week, uh, yeah, and that's what it says. But that's what it means. And then it also rotates nicely for you, so you don't have to remember. But we have that, I, those, since I don't know more about the particular behavior, I just came into the system, somebody said it's intermittently slow, they didn't give me a capture of when um, to focus on, I'll just, I'll, just take, I'll just take five minutes every 10 minutes, sounds good to me. Maybe we can see something from that. So let's do that, let's just keep that at that. And let's see, all right, where did I put that? All right, mm -hmm. yeah, so. It is, I actually would love for you to see, as much as I already had that prepared. Let me show you what we look, what uh, varlog sysstat does, because that's where everything is kept. You can change how, how many are kept. Um, yeah, so I have for the, since I set it up, how many days I have, and it's, it's, you can reference it by the day of the month in this case. And so if you want to reference, da, 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 da. so what I'm doing here is I have a particular SAR command that I want to do. In this case, I have, this is a, is a network one, um, and I have, I'm passing it to a file here. Uh, yeah, we'll refer to the man page for more detail, but overall, just the general sense, this is the 12th day of the month, because this is when I set up this VM. Uh, but it has all of that information in here, and this is the return I get from that. Um, it's real nice, because you can. Got all those. You just scroll around and you can see that the 24 hours of whatever you just set up. All right. So let's see if we see anything going on here. 
Da 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 da. Eight p.m. Looks fine. Looks fine. Looks fine. Was there a was there a question? Is there a huge jump? Hmm. Yeah, are we still going up? Down the other direction. So there was a point in time it did shut off this VM, so um, that might be the huge jump that you're seeing. Hmm. Yeah. 420. And then 420 over here. I'm still, oh yes, the, oh the huge jump. I thought you meant there was a skip in the logs because that would have been obvious I shut off the VM because I, yeah. Uh, so there was a, uh, I was doing a lot of things that this is not, so in this case it does look like there was uh, some pretty heavy utilization during this time. Um, you would, this wasn't part of what I was doing. I was rerunning some tests at this point. That's why that showed up. Okay, but uh, this is what you would look for because that is, as you, like this is a huge amount of utilization here for having nothing on it before. If someone's saying that I have an intermittently slow resync, why do I have all of this traffic here? Just, it, at 4, 10 p.m., in this case it was uh, because I was running tests on the system and uh, yeah, I, I, was, I, had a, I had a load generator that I was working with. So um, this is what I wanted. So why is it starting at 2 a.m. exactly is the point that I was trying to make. Um, you're, you're seeing a lot of traffic happen at a certain time. You can be looking for patterns of behavior because you get this output. You're saying, what is the pattern behavior that I have for the particular things that I'm searching for? So network activity uh, on particular interfaces. I don't think there's a way to break it down by interface or at least if anyone knows, let me know because I don't know how to, uh, to, to refine SAR any uh, finer than uh, these flags that I have, but this gives me each of the interfaces and um, how much throughput was going uh, through them at a particular point in time. So, e excellent. So, yes, hello. Yes, uh, it's possible to create DNR memory by using a well. Oh, absolutely, that's a great question because I have a whole, you said memory, right? Memory, yeah. Oh, oh, yes, great, because I have a whole thing on that. <laughs> Yes, yes, SAR is super useful. Um, I, it's, it's incredibly versatile and you are able to filter down. Also notice when I set up SAR that I wasn't like, okay, I wanna, I wanna do a, like a network test. I didn't need to do that. I just let it get everything and then I filtered for what I wanted at a particular day. So I know that we all are sort of inundated by information. Sometimes it's an information wall you need to figure out ways to break it down, make it smaller for your human brain to pack it in. And this is one way you could see it. You can say the time. Hello. Yeah. Question, yeah. There is, it also is sysstat. Um, I do not believe that it is based on cron. I do believe you can figure it slightly differently. Um, I didn't have time to get into both scenarios in this case. I also wanted to show Cron um, for that setup uh, because I do believe in like Alba, you do it, uh, I think you do it through systemd. I'm, but it is, it's slightly different. But it is through sysstat. Sysstat package is one you would use. Hmm. All right, so why do we have activity spike at 2 a.m.? I don't know, maybe it's a backup dot shell at 2 a.m. Could be, it's something to look for. I would have, in a normal situation, in an actual day to day in my job, I would ask like, I would probably look in cron myself before I get, you know, set it and forget it. 
However, um, let's say that this wasn't just directly on the system. Maybe it is just traffic that's just hitting that system. This isn't a cluster. This isn't a cluster anyway. So not everything is going to be scheduled directly on it. It's just something to keep in mind. If you're Especially if you look at multiple days over time and you say the same thing happening at the same time every day, something to keep in mind, just something that you can say, is this a scheduled activity? Why are we seeing this now? And then you can look for processes or other activities that are happening within the data path that might coincide with that. Just one way you could do it. Yeah, in this case, this, this was just, uh, yeah, this is an iperf3, just, just congest the entire thing, throw it at it for a while, uh, just to make a little demo. So that's SAR for you, but it's, uh, we're going to continue to talk about SAR uh, throughout the rest of this lecture um, because it is really useful. All right. We're going to go back to... Demo number three. It's not going to be all like this, don't worry. Okay. So now we're going to the next scenario. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes. Here we are. This one. Cont control plus. We good? Cool, wonderful, because this one, actually, I will want you to see the details on here. Uh, so I appreciate you uh, letting me know about this. So this is a scenario that we have uh, sort of building on the other scenarios. You go into the system. I'm not just going to go through top again. Like, you're going to go through the system. Oh, it looks like the activity is fine right now. I'm not seeing any, like, huge amount of utilization anywhere. Not a particular process that seems like it's, it's, it's hammering on one single processor. And I also looked through SAR earlier, and I didn't see, I di I didn't see anything historical that seemed uh, of note. So, uh, but why? But why might that be? This is a, this is a, just a, a particular case that you might want to check for. So, uh, let's not forget about the E section of, yeah, the E section of the use method. We want to look at what do we got over here. So I didn't see any heavy C CPU utilization, but like it's running like hot. Uh, so that's, that's an interesting thing to note. Why is it so hot? And don't, like, it, it would say dmessage, not dmessage.o. I actually didn't know what would happen if I just replaced dmessage, so I just put it at, I just made a different file. Uh, let's say I wanted to look at just the, okay, well, not, oh, extract. Okay, well, not that one either. I'm going to go in a bar log. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So this is one that isn't. It's specific to the application that I work with a lot, and that is a Coro Sync. That's a. It's got a heartbeat between nodes. Uh, the nodes need to know that, uh, that the other one is alive uh, so that it doesn't, uh, so they can do what it needs to do, avoiding split brain, knowing that it needs to uh, kill the other one in case it stops responding, things like that. Really important that these stay connected. So I happen to know that this process is a, is a real-time process. That's basically the highest priority you can have. It'll like everything at the expense of all of this process, it needs to happen. But it's telling me that this has not been happening, like this second, full seconds at a time, we're not seeing this being scheduled. But again, why are we not seeing some heavy CPU utilization? Why are we not seeing in SAR? We're not seeing all of this traffic happening with CPU. Why is it not being hammered? Well, it's because in this case, this is a VM. This is a VM 
that is on a hypervisor, what can happen is there's a few things that can happen when you've got um, a guest and you have noisy neighbors. You have a hog, a different tenant perhaps, that uses all the CPU on the, on, on, on the, the hypervisor, and then this VM didn't get any. He can't schedule anything, but it also can't really tell you anything about that. No, I'm dying. It can't do anything because it can't be, it doesn't have that visibility in most cases. In most cases, it does not have that visibility. This could be also a case where the VM was paused on the hypervisor. It's not going to be able to tell you. I don't think it was in this case because uh, the heat, the temperature, uh, but uh, that's something just to consider that it might be. Let's see, what did I say else about that? Yeah, um, one thing that you can look at that is an indicator um, is VM stat has, uh, if you do a VM stat, you can see. Let's see if I had the VM stat in here. Did I have VM stat? Uh, let's see what I got. Uh, VM stat. No, I just had, because it's just VM stat. VM stat's one you can use. Um, I wanted to show this. There's a lot of ways to see the ST here. Um, I think I want to use the V. Uh, we see that in top as well, that ST. Um, do we see it in top? Yeah, we should see it in top somewhere. But the ST, that's CPU steal time. That's steal time. Steal time is when a VM is waiting for a CPU from the hypervisor, and that's the amount of time it's like waiting for that. So if you see high steal time, that might be an indication. It's not necessarily going to always show that way because of the situation I described, especially if someone paused a VM to, pack, to back it up or something else happened. So I'm not, that's not going to be a guarantee. That is one metric, though, that you definitely want to keep a look at, especially if you have, you know that you're working with a VM. Um, a lot of times in my work, I don't, nobody's going to give me the hypervisor logs. They are just saying, well, this cluster is slow. They're not going to say to me, well, because I didn't give it resources to run. That's also another thing is that people could, um, on a hypervisor level, that someone could get, uh, could, could intentionally under-provision something uh, and to keep it and rein it into a certain amount of CPU or any sort of resource usage uh, arbitrarily. So it might be kept at bottom up because it's been told to, but it doesn't know that. So just something to keep in mind. Um, these are factors to consider, questions to ask, and defining a problem statement. One question to ask, is this a VM? Um, could, you, could you possibly give me some information on what's happening with this hypervisor during this time? That would be helpful. If they can, I would, I would love that. You would love that. Everyone would love that. Everyone liked that. Okay, so this is not going to... Surprise, it's different. Okay, so this is demo number four, but I wanted to show you something about it before I, uh, we dove into it, was I wanted to show you, recall that functional block diagram that we were talking about earlier, because uh, this is to give you a primer on like how, how this is working here, is that DRBD, it does a synchronous write um, in most cases, uh, where you get, you have a primary where that gets the writes, Something's written to it. Now it needs to make that synchronous copy, and it needs to do that over the LAN. So the network here is oftentimes the weakest point. That's often one that I'm going to look at if I'm looking for a bottleneck. It's also one that's fairly easy to check. Uh, something that's easy to check is, you know, something I want to check first because. Production systems are fussy, and I'd rather I'd rather do the easy things first. Uh, so that that's just giving you some context of why did I check the network first um, in this particular scenario where someone is saying that they are not getting the IOPS that they were promised on a newly deployed system. They said that they did tests before. They thought that they should be getting a particular. Uh, the, the network latency that they're saying is higher. Uh, there could be a bunch of things in this case. Uh, I'm not sure what I wrote about that. But as yeah, they didn't get the, they're not getting the IOPS that they originally benchmarked for. 
But I want to check the network. Uh, I could do it if I was not on a production system. I could do some A to B testing. I could shut the network, like the, fun the functionality for DRBD. I could say, just do the reads. Or just write to the, uh, just, just write to the primary. Don't even do the replication to the secondary. Because then it doesn't, it's not, it's not waiting for the acknowledgement across the network. It's not going across the network at that point. I could do that, but they're, they're using this system. I'm not going to do that. So what do I do? Well, well, okay. We're going to go back to boink. Oh. I'm going to use control plus all the time. All right, what do we got over here? Oh, yeah, all of my stuff. Great, wonderful. Oh, uh, yes. So I want to see how they've configured this. I want to see, in this case, this is a DRBD specific command, but that's just so that I can see what IP, ad what is their traffic running on, uh, what, how are they configured? So we see some IP addresses here. Uh, we usually say uh, for a DRBD setup, if you could put it on a, like a replication network specifically dedicated for replication specifically, so its own, its own little lane of traffic, because then you don't have to deal with other traffic on management or other applications that are happening uh, within your network that are potentially going to congest everything and delay replication. We just want something nice and clean and dedicated. One thing that is helpful for that, and this client did do this, it's helpful is that I can also, it's better for diagnosing particular issues with if we're seeing some slowness there. Oh, is that close again? Okay. Oh. All right. So what did I say that we could do now? All right. So I do want to see at that point, what do we got? How is that? What's this configuration look like? What interface is that? Um, what interfaces do we have on this, on this network here? And we've got these ones here, and we can through the. We can take a look here, uh, IPS. Uh, I'm sure people use the if config. There's some deprecated ones. Uh, IP, I think, is like the one that we should be using lately. IP. Uh, IP link show should give you some information on the interfaces and that's specific to uh, the traffic that you're seeing on them. You can see some things that could be indicative of issues with the network could be um, a large amount of uh, dropped packets. Um, but, those, but what we're looking for right here in this case, we just wanted to see what interfaces we have um, and the overall setup of this interface. Let's see, did I do the link show? Yes, I did. And that was the S link, yes. And then I do the ETH tool. Ah, yes, cat, procnic dev. That's another way we can look at it. A lot of these are, um, they're looking at the same systems counters. Here's just a different way to get it. Um, use what feels good to you, because uh, a lot of times look Look in the documentation on what system counter it is referencing. Um, that's another good thing you might want to do when you are doing a, a diagnostics, especially if you are using uh, some manner of uh, observability tool, is to use these different tools and the do use tools that do the same thing and see if you get the same number from it. And if you get different numbers for running what you th ostensibly thought did the same thing, well, now you've got reason to look at it. Is it maybe not quite what you thought? All right, so we've got, that's just another way that we can look at, at this interface and we can see the number of packets that are transferred over it and if there was potentially anything associated. Do I have my ETH tool command? Because I have a ETH tool, yes. I wanted to look at particularly, particularly that interface that was configured for DRBD in this case. So that's ETH tool. Um, ETH tool's great because you can use it to find what is the, conf the static configuration, how, how it is, what is it, it's currently negotiated speed. Um, see it's full duplex here. 
Uh, it is, yeah. This per, like, so in, I wasn't, I wasn't very creative with this particular demo, because like, I, I ran out of inspiration. So what I thought in this case was that this person said, I did some Nick trunking, and, and I should be getting double this. Uh, they said that, oh, well, but no, I, I'm, just I'm just checking behind them, and I said, no, 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 this is a misconfiguration. Uh, so the reason they're not getting what they expected is that it's not configured pr correctly, but this is just one way that you can check uh, what are our assumptions versus what is the system telling us. It's quite easy to, to, uh, to uh, misconfigure uh, when you're trying to uh, do some NIC trunking, and I have seen people that are trying to uh, bond the interfaces together, and they believe they have, but they, they made a mistake somewhere uh, just because it's difficult to do sometimes. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, check behind yourself. Uh, ETH tool is great for doing that. Let's see. What else did I say about that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, SAR. We were talking about SAR earlier and its other uses. Um, I love... I love uh, what SAR does for what you can look for the network statistics. We looked at these earlier, I think for the, yeah. Now, so what I wanna, what I wanna say about this one is that if you wanted to be able to measure throughput, notice I'm doing SAR every second. So how many, how, how many things are, are uh, how many packets are you know, transmitted, how many are received per second? Well, you might need that metric, but now you're doing it per second, now you have it. Just keeping that in mind, like that's, that's a way you could do it. Uh, you can average these out and uh, do what you need to if you're not necessarily getting that metric where somebody is doing the math for you. You could do the math also, just by running SAR every second. Uh, I don't know if I also just showed SAR before. This is just, you can say how often to repeat it. This is, uh, if you put one here, it's once every second. You also can enable live mode with SAR without having to enable historical data. Just a cool thing. Uh, if you just have it, have it ready to go in the chamber, uh, you don't need to set anything up in advance for it. I use SAR all the time. A uh, couple other things that aren't, well, they aren't like, they don't fit into the demo, but I'm gonna do them anyway, just so that I can say some things about them. Uh, there are uh, a couple ways that you can check for uh, latency on the network, um, but let's say that we wanted you to ping, you could do, yeah, ping is a valid way that you can measure um, round trip time of an ICMP echo packet. I just wanna say something about ping. Um, a lot of times firewalls, if it doesn't outright block them, it will put them at a lower priority, these packets that we're sending. So you're not necessarily gonna get an accurate measure of what, you know, what, uh, you know, your, your TCP traffic. Uh, we're gonna shut that off. Trace route, same way, same way for trace route. Uh, but trace route, so it will use, it will also get uh, deprioritized by the firewall sometimes, shows each particular hop, might be useful for you. You can, um, I'm just uh, the, I think I did it eight, I was just doing it through the Google DNS, just eight dot eight dot eight, might as well, easy to remember. But you can use, I don't know if I did this here, but uh, you can use the T flag on uh, trace route and you can switch it to TCP traffic. So you wanna get around uh, where it's gonna be deprioritized, just switch it to TCP. You could do that with Traceroute. Just something to keep in mind. All right, moving right along. Now we're gonna get into, well, it's gonna, it's gonna say what you expect it to say. Demo five. All right. I'm doing on time. I just want to make sure. I think we're, we started a little bit late, but I'm going to make sure that we can, uh, I'm going to kind of speed through these so that we can make sure to be, uh, get y'all to dinner and whatever you need to um, on time. Let's see. So this person said for DRBD, they extended the disk size. You can do that. Let's say that you've extended the backing volume through a variety of methods. Extend the file system because it's, 
yeah, you're able to do that. LVM, um, you, you, they made the they made the backing volume bigger, and then they resized the DRBD volume. You don't need to know necessarily how that works, but that it did work for them. They said that worked. It got resized. I could use the space, but now all my system is crashing intermittently. And what do? Why do? So, what do we look at when I have a hunch? So. Let me show you. Oh, got him. How are we doing? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so SAR with the B flag, that is going to be showing us um, particular, uh, you should see the, the you, what we're looking for is a large amount of uh, page outs. Uh, this one is not necessarily showing a lot right now because I think I did not do what I was expecting to do with this, but neither here nor there. Okay, so um, this is this is one that we want to look at. Um, also, if you have swap, not every swap is not necessarily used anymore on a lot of devices. You might be like, well, it's not hidden swap. Well, that's that a lot of a lot of things don't have swap anymore. But if you're looking for page outs, that's a high number of page outs is something to keep in mind. Uh, look out for when you're trying to diagnose a memory issue. Sidebar on a memory issue. If you do a free, free command, you know that's a common one you use for memory. That can overcount your memory because it also says you have the available memory of what is also shared between like you have a library it's shared between different processes so they're all using that but it's saying that you have more than you do because it's counting those multiple times just keep that in mind it might not be a necessarily accurate measure measurement i like to use the pressure stall information so we can do that by cutting over here okay so we're not seeing anything necessarily here this is a uh, an average of 10 seconds, 60 seconds, and 300 seconds. Um, and it is uh, where you have IO stalled waiting for memory. So if it doesn't have it and it's waiting for it, this is what it would show. It doesn't show anything right now. It might not show anything um, for a number of reasons. It could be a really recent spike. Uh, I would suggest you use also, they have the totals. So if you had a spike in the past, then you can say, well, it wasn't necessarily reflected in these, in these measures yet. Take a look at that total, see if that's been increased. So you can, you can take a look at it even if it hasn't been now averaged out. Uh, let's see, yes. Okay, so what, what was the problem? Well, the, well, I didn't actually run the problem because it didn't work the way I wanted it to. But uh, in this case, why did I suspect memory? because they resized the DRBD volume. DRBD requires one megabyte of memory per tebabyte of storage. They increased the storage. They did not remember. Well, maybe I didn't remember, but they didn't remember. They, they, they could get the size. Maybe they were right at capacity for memory. Then they increased, but now they need all that more. And so maybe they had enough, but now they've, they've, they've increased their map. Uh, that they need to uh, set up for. So, all right. All right. One last one, and it is my favorite one. So it's the last. All right. So, a client says that they have newly deployed cluster, and uh, it's it's not performing the, the way that they expected it to. Uh, there's higher I/O latency than they expected to have. And I said, "How did you run the test?" really important because how you've decided to write your test for uh, disk I.O. Uh, latency will make a huge difference in how it is represented. So let's say, oh, there's disk two over here. Puff, puff, puff. All right. So there's a few factors that go on uh, with uh, when you have this hypothetical. Let's talk about working set size. That's the biggest thing, and that's what this demo is ultimately gonna show, but I'm sort of speeding through it. In this case, you have a working set size that is very small. 
And working set size is super small, can fit all the way just in a cache entirely. Cache, as we could expect, a memory cache was super fast. Um, this could be a difference of a, a great magnitude. So like this could be, you could get latency of less than 100 uh, microseconds. If it hit the disk, because that how it could not, it was too big uh, to be fully in the cache, uh, had to hit the disk, then that's way different. That's, could be up to like eight milliseconds, more even. But that's, the, what, what I'm trying to say is that the working set size is a multimodal distribution where you have everything that's in the cache, and if it can be done in the cache, it's gonna be super fast. You have to hit, you have to hit the disk way slower. Uh, just keep that in mind for if someone has a super small working set size for their application, uh, where all the memory it requires can fit in there. If, it, if now they've tested with something different, a different workload that cannot do that, it's going to be a much different situation. All right. so. I am kind of, want, I want to make sure that I respect everybody's time, so I'm going to get back to the slide, but I have everything sort of summarized on here, so I can still talk about it. I'm just not going to be fumbling around on the command line. Imagine that. Okay. So, don't worry. Like, I'm, I'm talking about the same things. Okay. So, random versus sequential is super important. Uh, random, uh, well, let's uh, sequential first. Uh, sequential is where uh, something has been written. Uh, where it starts is where the last write ended. So the offset is exactly at the end of the last offset. As you might expect for hard disk drives that are uh, magnetic rotational, you're going to have uh, a lot of I/O uh, disk I/O is seek time, where it's moving around. So n less of a concern for SSDs. But if you have you have just a, a platter-based drive. Uh, if you have a sequential, if you're doing a test with a, a lot of people will test with DD, which is only going to do like a single threaded sequential, right? Well, what if your application is actually, well, it's not writing sequentially to your disk in a perfect order. It's, it's going all over the place as you do. Uh, you can't really test for that with DD. You can with FIO. So, um, FIO is what you want to use for, um, Fine is what you want to use for random writes. So the flexible I.O. tester. Uh, I love FIO because you are able to, not only can you do sequential, but you can also uh, do random. Uh, you, can, you can toggle various settings, the amount of, you can, do, you can fork it into different jobs that you repeat uh, in the same iteration. Uh, doing a test multiple times, oftentimes you can feel more confident in the results uh, that you've done multiple times versus just one time. You gotta think also though about uh, if you warmed up the cache, that may be, that might be a factor. Uh, ideally, you would be able to clear buffers and caches between, uh, like let's say that you're just writing to it, uh, especially if it's the same type of write. But we can't, we're in a production system. So we can't clear our buffers and cache. That'd be rude of us. So we're not going to do that. But keep in mind, a warm cache might give you different results. Overall, though, if you're benchmarking in general, uh, repeating the benchmark numerous times uh, in numerous different settings will give you more confidence in the result. FIO is great because you could say just like num jobs for, perfect. Set it and forget it. All right. So let's see. One way that you can tell, uh, this, is, this is how I believe that you, sh you sh in general c can make sure that, uh, oh, well, I'm just gonna put this up there. Yeah, because I have there. Yeah. Nope, I'm gonna go back. All right, I'll just have this all up here. Because, uh, yeah, the size of the individual rights. How can you tell if it's hitting the cache real fast? You're gonna run IOSTAT with the X flag while everything's running. IOSTAT is enabled in the kernel by default. It's super low overhead, so you don't need to worry about running it. Just keep it running in a different tab while you do your tests. That way, because IOSTAT is a tool that you sh it really should be called like disk IOSTAT because it's only doing disk IO. So if you see activity there, 
that's, and you expected it, great. Uh, if you don't expect it to hit the disk, then it is, well, now you know. Um, if you, in conversely, if you're doing a test and you see it never hits the disk, uh, you might want to do a different test if you expect that this stuff is going to hit the disks. All right, so uh, just being real fast to be respectful of folks' time, uh, the ratio of reads to writes. So if you have a metric that combines the two, uh, be suspicious of that because your application has a different ratio of reads to writes in a lot of cases. Figure out what that is and test accordingly. Uh, but if you lump them together in a metric, you can't see you can't see the different results for reads versus writes, so you can get less of an accurate metric to what's happening. Uh, obviously, SSDs, as we talked about with the seek time, they perform differently than um, magnetic rotational hard drives. Also, they are not, uh, I don't know if anyone's seen the YouTube video of Brendan Gregg shouting at a disk array. I would say it's super funny if you ever want to check that out. Uh, this was back before they like sort of did more soundproofing and this was, he had, he had a JBOD in a server room and he just, sh ah! and then he can say, oh look, the IO latency went way up. It's great. Love it. Because of the vibration. Because they didn't like it. Yeah. The disks didn't like it. Uh, and the RAID configuration at the RAID configuration can make a big deal as well for what's happening with how things are written for your application. If you have parity RAID, so a RAID 5, so like that's a, you've got a parity disk, uh, you will have to do a lot more calculations for parity that are going to cause a lot more IO operations to happen. It's going to be less performant than let's say a stripe, so across a, a couple disks. Uh, stripe size, uh, is another concept of RAID uh, that can be configured. But the size of the writes uh, can be matched to the kind of stripes of how the data is composed across that disk when you have uh, your different disks that you are uh, adding together for your increased performance. Match that stripe size to what your, act your workload actually is. Find out what the size of your writes are and then you can get a better stripe size. If, you're, if, if your writes are bigger than the stripe size on the disk, you might have some problems because it can't, now it's gotta, it's gotta move around a lot for that. Uh, we have size of the individual writes, that's not only that. A larger write is going to generally, um, it's gonna have higher throughput, but, uh, but, but the latency is gonna go down. So just, you, they behave differently. A little, a little, a little right is uh, gonna behave differently than a larger piece of data that you are writing. All right, I, I sort of flew through this one. Um, so I'm trying to see if there is anything else before I go to the last slide, because I know that I'm kind of going over. Hmm? Yeah, uh, yeah, okay. You could use the direct options for, to try and, uh, to account for not hitting the file system when you're doing your disk IO sets, tets, tests. You can do that for DD as well. Just keep that in mind. Uh, it might not be appreciable. Most of the disk, the, the IO you're gonna find is disk IO. One way that you can check to make sure that it is actually disks that are the problem, the, your, your bottleneck. Check your total application latency for, like, let's say, so we're doing a, a macro benchmark, uh, talking a macro benchmark again. And if the latency for the whole thing matches what you're seeing in IO stat, that's probably the disk, because you just found it. There it is, it matches. If it doesn't look the same, might not be them. Might not be them. All right. Okay, we're just gonna move. Yeah, we already talked about IO stat. IO weight is interesting, uh, because it's a little bit deceptive. IO weight is the measure of the time the CPUs are waiting for disk IO to complete. But keep in mind that that keeps that's how busy are your CPUs is a huge factor to that. So let's say that you're, you're they're performing some super inefficient processing. You're you're doing bad like you're doing bad things to these processors and they're working hard. Well then they won't notice that they're waiting for anything because they won't have time to do anything to wait for the disks. Uh, when you it, it could be that you will upgrade a system or you uh, you make a a program more efficient. Now you're seeing some higher IO weight, and you're like, but I upgraded the CPUs, why am I seeing more of this IO weight? 
because now it has time to wait. But conversely, IOI can go down, and uh, that's only because your CPU's got bigger. Your problem might have gotten worse, but you won't be able to tell. So you might need to, that's, that, it, that sort of relationship is just something that you want to consider. Any IO wait, keep an eye on it, because that is very indicative. There's a bottleneck in the relationship between those two. Uh, and uh, it's very vendor-specific, Smart CTL, but, or RAID controller tools. Those are from the vendor, but you can pull them accordingly. Um, and if you need to check individual disks to keep a, to scrutinize them, then uh, that's how you do. Where do you go over there? Well, uh, CPU profiling, you could do that with perf. We didn't have time to get that today. We certainly didn't have time to do a lot of things, but uh, we certainly didn't have time to get to perf, and we didn't have time to get to EBBF. I would just, I genuinely, it's so exciting if you read about it though. So I would say um, these slides will be available for scale, so. Uh, uh, if you have not looked at the extended Berkeley PEC filter and the extensions thereof, uh, definitely take a look. Thanks. Okay, well, overall, what I've said, to conclude, what I've said is that it's, I've said a lot of things about DRBD and clusters. All, all of the tools that I've focused on and mentioned, those are, those can be ran in pretty much any Linux system. And uh, hopefully there's some things that I've shown today. They might not show you everything, but they, they hopefully are directionally correct, and sometimes that's as much as you need, and you're just trying to narrow it down. You don't have a lot of time, uh, and you don't have the overhead to do a uh, stack trace. This might give you just as much correctness that you can put out the fire and keep on moving. All right, well, I'm gonna definitely, if anyone wants to, uh, to, to get questions, I have my business cards and stuff like that, we can talk on, over email, but overall now I'm gonna, I'm gonna let y'all go so that you can uh, go get dinner. Yeah.